Welcome to the first of the VNA Waterfront's SMME support webinar series. My name is Nwabi Samayama and I'll be the host of today's conversation. And I'm really hoping that we're going to have a riveting, a dynamic and an, an informative discussion with our panelists. Today's conversation is an introduction into e-commerce. And our panelists are people who've given up their time to come and share some of their insights with us. And I'll be introducing you to them. We've got Anne Lamont, who's a founding partner and director of Dive Collective. She has extensive experience in organizational development, purpose-led transformational work, and leadership development in digital future, innovation, and culture change. She has also spent a significant part of her career as a social entrepreneur, working in the development sector, both in South Africa and other African countries. She's an interim executive director of the Africa Leadership Initiative, as well as being a Synergist Senior Fellow at McNulty Foundation Laureate and Aspen Global Leadership Network Fellow. Anne is passionate about innovation, education, and the future of leadership, and is a theory UU practitioner. Our second speaker is Andrew Smith. Andrew is a commercial partnerships and strategic projects manager at the VNA Waterfront. He's passionate about sustainability and education and utilizing skills and networks for the betterment of the environment and society. As commercial partnerships and strategic projects manager for the VNA Waterfront, Andrea secured opportunities for the VNA Waterfront SMMEs to access special e commerce offerings. Third is Tamburai. Tamburai Chiruma is a managing director and co owner of One of Each, a bespoke African inspired handbags and accessories business. One of Each manufactures products from leather offcuts and ethnic printed materials in a shared studio off Baton Cunt Street in Cape Town. Tamburai started the business with her mother, Pauline, in 2014, and now employs nine staff. She operates a beautifully curated online store. Last, and of course not least, is Josh Meltz, the co-founder and CEO of Granadilla Swim. Granadilla, during COVID lockdown, the business pivoted to, Granad to establish Granadilla, Granadilla Eats, an online grocery store and delivery business created to help small businesses and local farms deliver groceries to residents in Cape Town. That really introduces who the panelists are. And of course, as I said, my name is Nwabi Samayama. I'm the Strategic Partnerships Director at the Branson Center for Entrepreneurship for South Africa. So having this panel really excites me. It's part of my work, but it's also part of what I believe in as an entrepreneur who exists for other entrepreneurs. Our questions are going to sit around sort of three issues at the moment or three pillars. And so I would like for us to make sure that at least in this first part of our conversation, we're really getting an understanding of what e-commerce is and what we mean when we talk about e-commerce. Then, of course, the second part of our conversation, I'd like for us to focus really on the real life experiences of entrepreneurs and, of course, entrepreneurs in the VNA waterfront front with e-commerce. And then lastly is a practical consideration in terms of when we talk about e-commerce, what platforms are we looking at? I would like to pose my first two questions, or at least the first second, you know, first two sets of questions to Anne Lamont and to Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Anne. Hi. 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 Good afternoon. So, Anne, I'm going to start with you. Is it possible for you to give us sort of an overview in terms of what is it that the VNA Waterfront is looking at as a strategy when it comes to e-commerce and of course how this actually provides you know an improved and supportive platform for the entrepreneurs within the VNA Waterfront? Thanks, Obesa. I think it's important just to articulate that for the VNA Waterfront. Um, this is part of a broader strategy. We are very committed to supporting our ecosystem and are following a purpose-driven strategy. So how can we support our ecosystem and support sustainability and support inclusivity? So it's very important to actually root e-commerce in, in that basis. And I think when the pandemic struck, although e-commerce was part of our strategy, it became fundamentally more important. But I think critically around that was how could we speed up our e-commerce strategy to support SMMEs and those who were really being most impacted, some of our smaller retailers um, at the waterfront. And I mean, Andrew will speak more about what exactly we're going to be doing um, around that now. 
But I think our biggest strategy is really around the fact that e-commerce is not about technology or a platform. It's really, really about customer experience. And the waterfront is known for creating experiential space. I mean, we're on the water, we have a beautiful mountain. So how do we really integrate digital tools and technology and I enable our tenants to both leverage that experience of being at the waterfront um, as well as bringing in digital channels and digital tools. So that became much more complex with COVID-19 when the experience of being waterfront um, became a lot more challenging. But things we are looking at are really how do we support um, aggregators, you know, if you look at Selzy who aggregate if you want them to shop for you, you know, they've had a 200% increase in sales over this period. So how do we link our retailers with aggregators who can perhaps support their sales? How do we link the back end and logistics, um, which are things like it's all very well selling online if you can't deliver um, or if you don't have click and collect space that doesn't really help you. Um, how can we support our retailers with payment mechanisms, which are quite different? And lastly, how can we support our retailers with a front end? Because we've just done a survey and, and many of you don't have, um, you know, e-commerce capabilities. So our, our longer term strategy is what is the sophisticated view on that in terms of supporting our retailers? But in the short term, how can we just enable pivoting much more easily? Um, and as, as I said, we are also looking at building a retail cluster. So how we can bring all of these technologies into one place and grow that from a jobs perspective for Cape Town, but also have one place where big retailers can go and find out what's happening around retail tech. Um, so Novisa, that's, that's you know, in a nutshell, very quick nutshell, what we're doing around e-commerce. I love that. And I love the fact that this response to e-commerce or, you know, this integration of e-commerce isn't one just a COVID-19 response, but it's also part of a bigger integrated picture in terms of making sure that the VNA Waterfront continues to be, you know, the platform and a host for a viable and a thriving entrepreneurial ecosystem in Cape Town and in South Africa, which is also important for, you know, any post-COVID recovery that we want to think about. So, yeah. Andrew... Linked to that, Anne's kind of mentioned sort of the, these these pieces that need to come into this e-commerce puzzle. And of course, you as the, you know, somebody who's involved in creating partnerships on behalf of the VNA Waterfront, they're very specific partnerships that you were focused on in terms of enabling e-commerce for our tenants and for our ecosystem there. Would you be able to share a little bit more around that? Also, you know, relating to what Anne has just shared with us, please. Sure, no, no, Peter. Um, I think what, what the last three months has, has shown us is, first of all, there are a lot of businesses out there in the retail sector who, who are under threat because they naturally haven't been able to trade or have had very restricted trade. Um, and we know that consumer behavior has changed from not being able to walk into a retail store, even though the lockdown restrictions have been lifted. There are a lot of people who don't want to be in a shopping center and have started conducting more of their retail purchases online. Um, so while their businesses are under threat, there is an opportunity here um, that COVID-19 essentially has sped up the migration to um, online sales. Prior to COVID-19, it's estimated that about 2% of South Africa's retail sales were conducted online. We don't have any updated stats yet, but uh, we're pretty sure um, that that has probably at least doubled or even tripled. Um, and I think many people who have migrated onto online sales uh, we'll, we'll stay there. Um, likewise, we've also noticed that there were a lot of businesses that didn't have a significant online presence or e-commerce presence and realized they needed to very quickly organize themselves to take advantage of the fact that people are still shopping, but they are shopping in different different ways. So what we did is, uh, we, off the back of a survey that we did amongst uh, the VNA tenants, we realized that we have, we have retailers at every level of e-commerce um, sophistication, right from no website and only limited social media, right up to website, um, online shops, payment gateways, um, and quite sophisticated uh, online marketing plans. So what we did is we went out into some of the experts in the industry, and we, we, we spoke to companies such as Shopstar, Parcel Ninja, and Yoko, 
as well as Pargo. Um, so all play in a slightly different area of e-commerce. And to date, I think uh, all the tenants have received notification that we've launched our drive-through click and collect um, with Pargo. It's a, it's a little kiosk that's located just outside the entrance at Tasha's. And uh, if you choose this as one of your, uh, on your fulfillment options um, as a tenant, if you include this as a fulfillment option, customers can now buy online from you. You can deliver a package down to that kiosk. They can drive through and not have to set foot in the mall um, if they so wish. So that's already live and happening. Um, but then what we did is we went and understood that there are quite a few tenants who don't actually have an online presence. They don't even have a website, for example, or they're just conducting, um, they're just conducting trade through social media. Um, so what we've negotiated with Shopstar is that there will be a three and a half month period where tenants can actually trade for free um, through Shopstar. So they can create a website through Shopstar yeah. and not have to pay any fees for three and a half months. Shopstar's normal uh, rate, is, they, they normally offer 14 days free trial, but we've managed to negotiate a, a lengthy period so that tenants can give it a go, see if the platform works for them. Um, and obviously there are payment gateways included in that. So very quickly and for, for virtually no investment and very little time, you can go from zero yes. online presence to a full e-commerce e e capability. We will be doing webinars next week on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Shopstar will have their own webinar where they can actually talk through their platform, how it works, um, and how to go about uh, joining the platform. So that's sure. Shopstar. Then uh, Yoko, obviously quite a few tenants already utilize Yoko as a payment gateway. Um, but there are ways to, Yoko actually have some tools that don't even require you to have one of the Yoko credit card machines. Um, it's uh, through push notifications, um, very, very simple, no contracts, it's just a payment per transaction. Um, again, there'll be some preferential rates for VNA tenants and there'll be a, a webinar next week. And then finally, Parcel Ninja have two services. The one is an outsourced warehousing and logistics service um, where they can keep your stock and literally you process an order and they take care of everything from there. They get the product through to the, the end consumer. And then they also have a really cool piece of software that allows you to aggregate or, or um, get the best rate for a courier um, to deliver your package. So that's also software that's available through subscription, much like um, hippo.co.za allows you to compare insurance quotes with eight through eight different insurance agencies. This will give you real time live quotes from seven or eight courier companies. You pick the one you want, you print a Weibull, put it on your package, and the courier company picks it up and delivers, delivers it to your customer. So these are all really exciting um, opportunities. We've negotiated some really good rates, and there's a full detail um, next week on each of them. Great, and I'll share some information about next week's webinars, of course. But what I really like is that we're talking about real, you know, realizable um, solutions, accessibility to those solutions, because it's no use just setting these, these things up, but then accessing it is, you know, red tape nightmare or lots of signups and that, that kind of thing. And also, you know, acknowledging the reality that some of these things do require some sort of investment, but at least for this period, we'll waive some of those fees or at least a VNA waterfront, you know, assist as a backer of some sort. So, that's really exciting. But what it means is that we're starting to really, really capture and understand and now accelerate this under, um, this idea that e-commerce is not only just about a post, you know, a COVID present, but it's a post-COVID reality. And so can we even between, you know, you and Anne, can you quickly maybe give us why you think e-commerce is actually beneficial to our entrepreneurs? Because right now I think we're all just thinking, well, if people aren't coming into the shops and therefore I need to have another way of interacting with my customers. But what really are the bigger benefits of, um, you know, engaging in e-commerce? And of course, also understanding that being an e-commerce trader isn't just about having an online presence, but it's about having a proper e-commerce channel for your customers. So basically, you know, between the two of you, could you maybe give us a brief overview and bounce between the two of you around the benefits of e-commerce? Because after that, we'll then see, you know, the proof of the pudding when we call in then Josh and Tambourine to the conversation. So you two are almost like the guys who give us the theory and the ideas, but we've got the real entrepreneurs will give us the real story as well. 
Yeah, so I, I think if, if, if I look at it, I, I think exactly as you said, it's not just about having an online presence and it not, it's not just because you were forced to have an online presence. And, and I think for a long time, the view of online sales has just been, we need a website. And it's, it's, it's not really about that. It's about an extension of your, your customer experience. So your customer really having the ability to shop with you and interact with your brand in, in different ways and have an experience that, that works for, for them, whether it's going to be online or coming in physically, um, is something that customers are going to be looking for more and more into the future. And I think the other real benefit of e-commerce is it gives you a particular kind of information and, and data which should be integrated both with your physical um, experience, but also with your online experience. So it enables you to start to, to custom make, but you do have to have a strategy that is not just an add-on. You need yeah. to really think through what is your physical store about? And then what is your online presence about? And how do those two talk to each other and how do they make your customer experience seamless? And I think if you get that right, um, you really can be very successful um, because people go to an online or physical space for different reasons, but they want a seamless experience. Um, so globally, it, you know, it's very much shown that those are those stores that understand that and retailers that understand that are growing and ones that don't are, are not being successful. And that's post-COVID. It's not just a COVID response. Yes, yeah, yes. Thanks, Anne. Andrew, can I give you one minute to give us sort of your thoughts on the benefits of e-commerce? Yeah, I, th I agree with everything Anne said. I think the, the other key point is, is having a, a good e-commerce presence allows you to increase your, immediately increase your potential customer base. Um, it allows you to service people anywhere in the world, anywhere in the country. Um, and obviously that requires um, some knowledge around how to market yourself digitally, but I know that's, so that's another area that will be uh, dealt with in these webinars. So yeah, just have, have a, the potential to increase the amount of shoppers. Um, and I think that can only expand your business. Fantastic. Thank you. So, I mean, talking about, you know, real businesses that have engaged in these e-commerce platforms, we've got Josh, who is from Granite Villa Swim, and of course, Tamburai, who's from one of each. And so they'll be coming on. And in the meantime, I'm going to share some information with you around the next webinars that will be coming through. So on Monday, there will be another learning lunch, which will be a webinar presented by Parcel Ninja. So that's Monday, the 29th of June from 12 until 1. Tuesday, 12 until 1 on the 30th of June will be Shopstar. And Wednesday, the 1st of July, 12 to 1 will be Yoko. So please also make sure that you're signing up and registering for those sessions because that's when you'll start getting information around these specific partnerships that exist for you at the VNA Waterfront. Hello, Josh. Hey, Norbisa, how are you? Good, thank you. And you? Hi, Tamburai. Hi, Norbisa. Hi, Josh. Hey, Tamburai, how are you? Fine, and you? Good, thanks. Good. It's great. It's great to see you entrepreneurs surviving and thriving and great that you are able to give us some of your time to share with us some of your insights. So I'm going to get straight into it and um, start with. I'm going to start with Josh, because I think it's, you know, specifically even how I introduced you was also talking about how you pivoted your business, even in terms of your offering. And so <laughs> what challenges were you facing as soon as COVID struck? And what challenges are you currently facing? And of course, how are you dealing with them? Okay, well, I'll try and give a brief synopsis of kind of the order of events that happened that, that led to us, I guess, moving from a, well, adapting a swimwear business and turning it into a grocery business or creating a new business with some infrastructure that we had. So we're a, a predominantly a swimwear business. We've been around for five years and a week before lockdown started, we had an internal meeting and realized that a lot of our channels would be closed in the very near future. And our revenues would be wiped almost to zero bar what we would be able to do in an e-commerce space. And I'll chat a little bit about what we did for Grand Villa Swim in the e-commerce space, maybe a little bit later. Um, and so we, 
we kind of looked at Adam, my business partner, and I looked at at some of the assets and some of the infrastructure and some of the team that we had, and decided that we could actually pivot our business. We could use our e-commerce store. We could use our fulfillment team. We could use um, another business that we had, which is a kombucha manufacturing business. We had this warehouse facility, which had a food safe certificate and a cold storage. Um, we had good relationships with um, delivery and fulfillment um, businesses. And so we had all the necessary tools to do this. The only thing we didn't have was produce. Um, and so our initial project started with a collaboration with um, the Aronizic City Farmers Market, and we bought produce directly from their farm. Um, and that was sort of the key that got us up and running. And we, we launched it very quickly. Uh, there were some pros and cons to launching it so quickly. We were the first to market, but we also hadn't perfectly perfected the, the customer um, experience. So we did a, an incredible volume of, of business in those first few weeks, and we were overwhelmed. And at, at times, we had to turn our, our website off. We had to turn the adverts off, and we had to actually cut orders on certain days. And so the customer experience wasn't, I wouldn't say A+. Plus. Um, we had the benefit of now being the first to market and really establishing a big customer base, which we're very grateful for. And, and it's, I think, been the reason that we've been able to continue this and this business will actually exist long beyond COVID. Now the challenge that we're facing three months later is that it's a highly saturated market. We, we're now um, we're in a, a, a business world where anyone who was producing food or doing fresh produce or a small um, business kind of provider or in a grocery store has gone online and is doing delivery services, which is fantastic. I'm very pro um, people ordering um, online and not, not actually going to the stores unless absolutely necessary. But it has made it for a much, diff a much more challenging um, environment to do business. It's a much more saturated and competitive market. Right. But, but I think for us, the, the, the reason we were able to do it really comes down to these fortuitous um, um, assets and teams that we had available. It, it, it really was um, a matter of luck. There was a huge amount of luck and and things that fell into place, having recently invested in a kombucha business and having our e-commerce team from Grand de la Swim set up. So, yeah, it was kind of matching together these different skill sets and different teams that, that enabled us to get it going. Um, but certainly lots of challenges ahead, but, but excited to be in a new space and have created some jobs during this time rather than... Um, having to lay off staff, which Great. which means it feels quite successful. It kind of validates the whole thing. Great. And so Tambourai, you know, linked to what Josh has just said about the customer experience and then also connecting with what Andrew and Anne had shared with us, which is that e-commerce isn't just about having a website. It's actually an extension of your customer's journey and, you know, the experience that they have with you. I know one of each has been quite focused on in making, you know, creating delightful and red hot feel good experiences for their customers for a while now and knowing that your customer base tends to you know also you know have a nice mix between local customers and international customers are you able to share with us sort of your learnings as you know as you've grown created perhaps refined your e-commerce offering and what that means for you and how what can you share with some of the entrepreneurs in this conversation in terms of what you've learned maybe the traps to avoid and the things to delight in Thank you, Nalisa. Uh, well, basically, I think we quickly realized that um, with COVID and what had happened, um, this was now wholesale buying season for us, where we predominantly sell, um, you know, larger volumes of stock to stores that we actually supply, who then resell for us in the export market. And, you know, that, as Josh said, would have completely stopped. And we then realized that, you know, mask making is something that we're going to have to take on but we're going to have to take it on very quickly but also i think it was challenging in a sense where 
for a really luxurious product, not just like a 10 rand mask or a five rand mask and that kind of thing. So we needed to see how do we utilize the resources that we currently have in our manufacturing space to produce a, a high quality um, product. And I think, you know, one of the major learning curves was that the demand was very high for a very short period of time. So we've always had an e-commerce platform. Um, I mean, I was fortunate to have worked for a company like Payfast to actually understand the e-commerce space a little bit more and, you know, know that, okay, these are the type of platforms that I would like to use and that kind of thing. So we had to, you know, do it really, really quickly because there was just this peak season of two weeks where everybody just wanted a mask. You know, so also I think some of the things that we had to deal with was, you know, the psychology of bringing people back into the work environment and ensuring them that they would be safe, you know, um, you know, and, and that kind of thing. But um, I think from a customer experience, because our products, similarly to I think most of the other, um, especially watershed tenants, are of higher price points. So you're so used to dealing with clients one on one, you know, mm -hmm. but. I think e-commerce just then shifted that idea of understanding that you're going to be selling in high volumes, so you have no time to be speaking to people individually, so you need a system that's going to work in terms of user experience for your customers, but also user experience for you so that the flow can work really well. That's an interesting consideration because I think a lot of times when we think about e-commerce, we think about what we experience. And so when I think about the user journey, when it comes to engaging with a, an e-commerce platform, I'm thinking about my needs. But I think it's also important to make sure that as a business owner, you're taking into account your user experience as well, so that you then are encouraged to update things regularly. You're able to quickly respond to customers' needs. And obviously, you're able to you know, even manage your inventory correctly through your e-commerce platforms. And therefore, that means that your user journey from both ends of this conversation is actually optimal and therefore we're all happy. So that's a really nice point, Tamber. I thank you for sharing that with us. Um, one more question to the both of you is, do you think that the changes that we've, you know, you've had to make in your business, are they permanent? And what do you think will maybe be some of the changes that you have to make now that maybe will no longer endure into a post-COVID world? Of course, we also know 2020 has taught us not to plan that much or predict things, but let's try. What do you think is going to be sort of an enduring change that you made during this time in terms of your e-commerce offering? And what do you think you might maybe, you know, pull back on when things come back to a new normal? I'll start with you, Josh. Cool. So for us, um, as I think would be applicable for all businesses, we've had a, a, a time to be quite reflective and to do a, cut, a cost cutting exercise in our business and reduce all fatty parts of the business and really be quite clinical and quite stringent, um, really for the sake of survival, right? In a time of, of crisis like this, surplus expenses really kind, kind of don't have any place in, in a startup or in a small business. So from that perspective, our, our kind of attitude towards expenditure will change dramatically and I'm sure it will be a long lasting effect. And I think that that is something that will be applicable for all small businesses going forward. I think our push towards e-commerce is a long lasting and, and, um, it's something that will stay with us. I think our, our energy and time will be far more dedicated and focused to e-commerce as we go into the future. And I think that Andrew alluded to it that what has happened in South Africa is not that people have just learned to be online or that there's this crazy um, new wave. It's just an acceleration. We, we were on our way to having a bigger e-commerce um, sector but it has just accelerated a number of years. And I think businesses need to adapt and accelerate their interest in e-commerce kind of in parallel to how customers have, have moved online. So for us, our energy is now far more focused on digital. Um, it is less focused on retail. We, we were never particularly focused on retail because we're such a seasonal product, but we're certainly even less focused on retail now and, and more focused on digital experiences and ways of reaching customers um, 
through digital marketing rather through, than through physical um, activations or, or through retail experiences. Um, so yeah, that's I'd say those are the long lasting effects. Um, I, I wonder I wonder if if consumer behavior is a long lasting effect. I think that there will be a reduction. I think as things ease, people will naturally want to be out of their homes and and want to get go to the shops. I think we've already seen that just seen that happening in um, around us. But I do think there is a new equilibrium or a new point of of um, online shopping that is here to stay and will continue growing from that base. So for right. us, that's where our kind of kind of heads at. And Tampere? Yeah, I think for us, similarly to, you know, cutting down a lot of costs in terms of um, actual spaces, you know, so moving into the digital space, but also I think the digital space is so huge that it's so important for us to be able to use the resources that we have. So, for instance, things like photo shoots and that kind of thing, setting up, you know, empowering the current stuff that we have to set up like a small little booth to do things more on our own than bringing in a lot of outside resources that are going to cost us money that we don't have, I think has been a major learning because when we set up the e-commerce store in terms of uh, moving over platforms, you know, I had to pretty much do all the photography myself. And I actually realized that, you know, I don't always need to pay someone to do this, it's something that I can do on my own, you know. So definitely, you know, um, focusing on being more um, also in, in terms of the content that we, we we share with people, even on by having this e-commerce platform, but then, you know, how you need customers, because I feel that that's actually what has brought the business in because of the fact that our customer understands our story, our customer understands what we're trying to do in the long run, you know, so definitely, um, especially even worldwide, you know, even if we go back to um, the issue of some of the challenges that we faced is that although we were selling these really beautiful face masks, a lot of our international community wanted to buy these from us. But then we later realized that you needed a special permit to actually export these as well, you know. Mm -hmm. So you know, those were also some of the challenges and the learnings, but um, definitely also understanding that prior to to implementing this e-commerce strategy we had missed out on quite a large chunk of local clients that are hungry to buy um, locally made and produced items you know because especially if you have a very strong story which people resonate with people want mm -hmm. to buy from you but they're not necessarily always going to be walking into the watershed because of the fact that there is a perception that we are selling to tourists you mm -hmm. know so definitely um we've managed to capture like a good local um, clientele and also customers that then were buying from us before in terms of um, when we started the brand. You know, so when we started the brand, we had quite a lot of local clients supporting us, but, you know, they want new products and something different and something new. So we regained that clientele again, you know. So that was also something really interesting to see that um, clients also sometimes buy to support not yeah. particularly because they need the item or they want the product, but also just from that support element of understanding the situation that small businesses are experiencing right now. So definitely exactly. cutting down on costs and spaces that we actually don't um, need is something that's really important going forward. Thank you for that, because I think what we're talking about now is that e-commerce isn't then just about then a great you know, functional uh, website that we're, you know, a platform where I can buy things, but there are all these other supporting channels and platform that actually form part of my bigger e-commerce existence. And so, you know, I'm going to continue with you, Tambarai. What platforms are you using to create your e-commerce universe at one of each? Okay, so in terms of the actual selling platform, I mean, we were on um, WooCommerce and... I always wanted something that we could use in-house because I found it quite difficult to use WooCommerce. Personally, that was my um, experience. And also, like I said, having worked at PayFast, I got an understanding and an ability to work with a lot of entrepreneurs and understand what people are really looking for. So we've used Shopify. Um, a lot of people you know, say that it's expensive, but I mean, I like certain things about the fact that like I can pretty much get a lot of lessons online in terms of how to do, you know, 
certain things. And I think the user experience I really like from an aspect of my customer as well as um, the buyer. You know, when someone is making that purchase, the ability to set, you know, put in a tracking code and the exact career that's going to deliver and all of that, you know, because I think if your customers are so used to a specific experience that you give in person, when that experience differs online, then it's got the potential to really hurt your brand. So yeah, we're using, um, and then of course, um, Facebook and Instagram, but you know, it's been quite challenging because previously we had someone who was running our um, you know, Facebook content and that kind of thing. So one of the challenges has been to connect, you know, the Facebook um, Instagram store to our Shopify because this individual sort of, you know, running the, the ads manager page and that kind of thing. So also that's something to out for, I think, for people who are setting things up that ensure that you have that control, you know, because sometimes when you outsource things, you don't have access to these people and, you know, it creates a lot of admin of you having to contact Facebook to, you know, put a page admin dispute and that kind of thing. So also right. Facebook has got a resource called Facebook Blueprint where you can actually do these um, online courses to learn um, all these various things to actually implement within your social media strategy as well as your e-commerce strategy to be aligned at the same time. Fantastic. That's really helpful. Josh, also your practical sort of experience in terms of the platforms you're using to create the Granadilla Eats and the Granadilla Swim e-commerce world. Sure. Uh, look, let me, let me just reiterate what Tambara is saying, which I think is really a good pertinent point that the ability to understand um, your platforms and understand what it takes to digitally market a product online is quite critical. And going into it totally blind and outsourcing all of those skills may feel like you're ticking the box, but it can totally miss the point. It can be cost ineffective and it can um, ultimately hurt your online store quite a bit. So I think I would definitely take the time to do the introductory courses that Facebook, Google, mail, um, CRM platforms have to offer and take some interest in digital marketing. I think without some kind of understanding of how to get customers into your store and understanding the sources of traffic on your store, you are kind of shooting in the dark. It's, it's, like, it's like opening a, a retail store that is beautiful and magnificent and has 20 changing rooms and has stock for days and is beautifully resourced and has posters all over it out in the field with, with no customers to, to come and shop in it. So they, the two need to be paired together really well. And I mean, using a, a good platform, and I think Shopify is a fantastic one. I think it's really user-friendly, and I think people can build their own websites relatively easily. Um, so I would be a big advocate of using Shopify. We use a combination of Shopify and Magento. Um, but I would also say an a keen interest in digital marketing is, is kind of the second pillar for success. And without understanding how these platforms work to generate traffic to your site and how much it costs to generate traffic to your site, I think you are... Those are the two fundamentals that, that I would suggest. Um, we, I, I'll talk about one that, that I've learned about in the last couple of months, which I find really fascinating and, and powerful. It's, it's a CRM um, mail uh, service provider called MailerLite. Um, it is an automation or, or a multiple email um, sending tool. And particularly for our, our a grocery business, which is a repeat business, um, it's, a, it's a business customers can, can shop with us once a week or even multiple times in a week. And we need a, a way of reaching them quite directly and quite personally to tell them what is happening on our store that week. And because we're doing fresh produce, a lot is changing, right? We're, we're adding in these amazing organic oranges one week. And one week we're taking off the pineapples because pineapples go out of season and we only shop... Uh, stock seasonal produce. So you can tell that story through social media and you can use audiences to target your customers and, and you can do quite segmented adverts. But we found that it's been more cost effective and more direct and far more economical to use email to, to, touch, on our, um, to touch our customers, 
to speak to them. I just see Amanda's asking a question here. It's it's called Mail Light. I'll, I'll put some links up um, afterwards as a resource, and I'm happy to take questions on about how it works. But I'd definitely say that email um, is a fantastic channel to reach your customers. You already, if you have been running an online store for some time, you already have a database, um, and that is the the most likely person to ever purchase from you again is one of your customers. Yeah. So I would say focus there before you try and acquire new customers and do retargeting and remarketing. Focus on the group of people that have shopped with you before. Tell them how you've changed your business. Tell them what your new offering is. Do it, as Tamburai says, do it in a way that makes sense for you in terms of communication. Um, and I think well-segmented and, and well-constructed emails through a, an email platform like MailerLite or MailChimp or, or any of the other CRM platforms is really, really powerful. Fantastic, fantastic. I'm going to give the two of you a break for now, and I'm going to pull back um, Andrew and Anne from the VNA because there are some questions from the audience, and I'll be taking a few more, of course, from the audience. Um, and so whilst we wait for Anne and Andrew to be brought back into this conversation, um, I do want to remind you that if any of you are using social media and are maybe sharing aspects of this conversation with your community, you're more than welcome to tag the VNA Waterfront, which is at VNA Waterfront. And of course, our hashtag is hashtag VA Learning Lunches. So for Anne, um, we have a question here, which is, could you let us know if the VNA Waterfront is planning a watershed e-commerce shop? similar to the Karma's platform. And I think it might maybe even link to this idea that you alluded to right at the beginning, which was this concept of retail clusters. So I'm not sure if the two align, but I think they do. So do you think you can just share a little bit with us around the question of what is there a possibility of an e-commerce um, platform for the watershed specifically? And also when you talk about retail clusters, what were you actually um, talking about at that point? Okay. Um, so there is a possibility. It's something we're investigating at the moment. But I, I think it's it's a very complex issue um, to create a watershed. I mean, I think, you know, when you were speaking um, to people in the real world, um, sharing just how you shouldn't go rushing in. And, and I think we're very much not wanting to go rushing in um, in the context of COVID-19 but it is definitely something that we're exploring. And some of the issues to look at is that, you know, I, I think each brand has a, bit, a distinctive experience and look and feel and engagement um, that, you know, everybody speaks about, you, you, want to, you want to keep that and you want to keep that link. So when you create an aggregated e-commerce space or a front entrance for the watershed and how we think about that, it's actually quite complex. So, and to do it properly, you know, high cost. So it's, I'm now I'm not answering it. It's absolutely something we're investigating, but it is definitely not something that we are, are ready to move on or whether we even think that that's the right strategy. And what I would suggest, because there are lots of people on this asking that question, that we will be engaging with our tenants. We're trying to create our strategy and collaboration with tenants on it. On the second issue, which is retail cluster, what we're speaking about um, specifically is obviously there's, a, there's massive growth globally and locally in terms of online retail. Um, we're just a little bit behind the, the trend. And there are a lot of um, small scale and growing technology players who, who work in, in that space. Um, and it's starting to create jobs and we need to create jobs there because we may lose those jobs um, as sort of traditional retail may, may close down. So the Waterfront actually wants to create a physical space where technology players and innovators working in retail um, can be clustered together so that they can learn from each other so retailers who are looking for solutions can have a physical space to go to um, and that we can grow the economy um, around retail innovation. Um, so that is that is really what I mean when I say retail cluster is we're already doing it in, in Workshop 17, but to expand it in a much more um, focused and considered manner. 
Fantastic. Andrew, I have a question that feels like it could be for one of the entrepreneurs, but I'm thinking that with your hat as somebody who's involved in strategic partnerships, um, you might also be able to give some insights into this, which is we have an entrepreneur, Anna Richerby, who's from Beloved Beadwork, who I love as well. Um, she says that they finally launched an online shop and the, she finds that the major stumbling block was that existing relationships with international wholesale buyers who actually offer limited selections of her products. And then it means that by the time, you know, those products are being sold, you know, the prices have doubled. So she's asking, do we have any advice on how to manage relationships with wholesale buyers when launching an international online retail shop? Um, I think uh, maybe Tamara is probably better equipped to answer that. And I wonder if we shouldn't bring her in um, into that. Yeah, I think perhaps, um, you know, I thought I was trying to bring in maybe your strategic partnerships way of thinking. But of course, I think from a practical point of view, Tambor Rai is probably better suited. So let's see if Tambor Rai can come back into the conversation, because I think it is important, you know, when we talk about going into e-commerce, we're talking about, yes, capturing. And I think it was lovely when Tambor Rai mentioned this idea of reigniting or re-energizing a local customer base. But we're also talking about this almost infinite universe of customers who exist all over the world. And so we do need to have strategies on how to you know, manage relationships and manage some of the stumbling blocks that might come through you know, when we're also trying to make sure that we are still preserving and creating jobs and, of course, making sure that we're attracting the right customers. Okay, so I think, you know, what we do on that um, front is that when we supply a specific client in a specific region, so let's say in the U.S., we would always push our clientele in the U.S. to buy from that online store. You know, first of all, to shave, save them on the shipping costs, as well as to ensure that we then get larger wholesale orders and then buy at once. Because usually what we do find in terms of our pricing is that when we've you know priced that item when shipping is added it usually is the client that we are supplying or that particular online store so we haven't really had any issues with that aspect but maybe uh, maybe it's you know different in terms of smaller items or that kind of thing but generally we try to push that our clients in that specific area buy from them and then we are able to then you know, restock those clients to ensure that we are producing items in larger volumes, you know, for cash flow purposes and that kind of thing. So that's the business model that we use um, and it's worked thus far, but it all depends in terms of your price point and how, how you know, before it was difficult, but we've decided that we, you know, the, our price points needs to match when they reach that side because we've had you know, some question, customers you know, overseas questioning that you know, on your website it's a specific price, but then, you know, and even if you do add the shipping, there is a difference, but still sometimes you know, that little difference actually comes to that person. But yep. we've maintained trying to push um, selling to our, you know, the clients that we supply who are then resellers, like in the US and those type of countries. Thank you. It also feels like, I think, um, just as a comment, that I think this, uh, you know, concept of international shipping, inter export, say, um, you know, creating a customer base outside of South Africa, that feels like it could actually be the beginnings of a separate topic for another webinar another time. So I'm throwing the challenge back to the v and waterfront um, because, of course, these lunch, you know, lunch learning lunches are part of, you know, the waterfront's broader SMME support strategy, um, you know, in this COVID world. And so, and you're coming back with another question that's come up, which is, is the VNA waterfront able to, you know, use its relationships and leverage, you know, the tenant base to get discounts on common products, packaging, subscription, courier, that sort of thing for, you know, the tenants at, the, you know, for, for this community that we're talking to right now? And if so, what what is in the pipeline if you're able to share? Well, I, I think our starting point is obviously some of the service providers that we discussed that are going to be doing webinars next week. Um, so yes, I think the simple answer is yes, we will certainly look to use the, the power of the VNA as an overall entity. Um, and I think it's going to very much depend on what those needs exactly are. Um, so for example, um, imagine one day we had a courier service from the VNA, so someone could buy 
an item from four different tenants at the VNA. They can all get packaged together and sent via one courier service directly to that person's home or office or wherever they want it. So depending on what the need is, um, we will certainly look to, to try and negotiate that. So I know that's quite vague, but I think it's once we understand exactly what those things are, um, yeah, we, we, must, uh, we must go and have, have those discussions with those suppliers. Absolutely. And I think then it also means it's a great opportunity for me to also remind everyone in this conversation that there are means in which you can contact the VNA Waterfront specific to, you know, receiving support and assistance during this time. And so you can actually email the help desk directly at SMME help desk at waterfront.co.za. SMME help desk at waterfront.co.za. And you could also, I guess, use some of those emails to maybe prompt the VNA Waterfront with more questions. Um, and that will probably start informing, you know, people like Andrew in terms of what decisions to make in terms of how to further support our entrepreneurs, both during this time and going forward. And so we are nearing the end of our webinar, or at least our learning lunch. And so I'd like to hear once more from Josh and from Anne. So thank you very much, Tambara and Andrew, for sharing your insights with us. Thank you for your time. And um, I'm waiting for Andrew, at, sorry, for Josh and for Anne to join us. And we can then wrap up this webinar. And then, of course, look forward to seeing you next week and in the, you know more weeks to come. Um, as I said, we've got our next learning lunch will be on Monday with Parcel Ninja. Tuesday will be Shopstar, Wednesday will be Yoko. Remember, it's nice and easy. Each of the um, learning lunches happen at 12 until 1 on this very same platform. So as we wrap up, Josh, what do you think is the future for your business, um, you know, in a post-COVID world? And just your final impressions in terms of how you are going about your business during this time? Sure. Well, look, for me, I'm not really thinking too much about post-COVID. I'm thinking about what we can do today and next week and maybe next month. We're, we're not really planning too, too far ahead of that. And we are trying to be dynamic and adaptive and nimble, okay. which means cutting costs and being flexible to the changing um, marketplace and, and changing economic kind of environment around us our future is digital our future is certainly in creating as Anne alluded to earlier um, customer journeys and customer experiences that are direct and applicable to the audiences that that we speak to that have a true value proposition that is exceptional and brilliant um, potentially that tell a South African and an African story and a global platform I think we're focusing locally right now, but I think there is an amazing opportunity to to use digital and as as the world becomes more digital to really be expansive. Um, but for now we are we are kind of bracing ourselves and and being as as um, combative in this time and as nimble in, in this time and yeah, trying to make it through the next kind of few months before we start scaling up and going global. Great stuff. And and to conclude this learning lunch, um, and given the fact that you'd kind of given us a bigger picture around the strategy and you know the context of why the VNA Waterfront is even in this conversation, what excites you about the entrepreneurial ecosystem for the VNA Waterfront's tenants in relation to this world of e-commerce? Well, I just, I just get excited when I listen to Josh saying we're going to go global <laughs> and an African and South African story. And, and I think that excites me. Uh, I mean, both, you know, there's been so much grounding here in purpose, you know, buying local, understanding the story, taking the African story globally. Um, I, I think for the VNA as well, we're very grounded in what we're doing in, in purpose and what we want to create and, and inspiration. And, and I think e-commerce gives you that ability, um, although we're all in survival mode at the moment, to to also you know dream um, of taking the story just story wider. So that's really what inspires me. But I do want to acknowledge that it's tough times, and this is very much about trying to help each other, um, which also inspires me. 
Absolutely. I think this is what this learning lunch is about as well, which is that we acknowledge the fact that we need to rely on each other. We need to, you know, acquire information, insights, advice and support from each other as entrepreneurs. And of, of course, those of us who have information. So thank you so much to my four speakers. Um, it was really, really wonderful for me to engage with you. And I think, Anne, for me, as a wonderful parting shot, you mentioned this idea of purpose. I think, you know, this time is, you know, compelling so many of us to reflect and to really start thinking about what is the purpose of our businesses, what is the alignment between ourselves and our businesses and our purpose and our purpose. And therefore, for me, as somebody also comes from the Branson Center for Entrepreneurship South Africa, we really do believe in this idea of business being a force for good. And so this really excites me that we're talking about you know, using our businesses as forces for good, whilst of course we do survive. So thank you so much to the VNA Waterfront. Thank you to everyone for joining us during your lunch break, and we will see you on Monday. Thank you.